it's always great to be back here at the INSS. It's great to see Frank Louis. And uh, truth be told, not simply because of Frank's uh, Israeli connection, but also because of his Australianness. Uh, uh, he has played a very substantial role in uh, reinforcing, and I, take, I put on my French hat for a moment, for reinforcing the strategic relationship between France and Australia at a time when Asian Pacific affairs are becoming pivotal to the future of the security of Europe. Uh, and it is ob an obvious pleasure uh, to be with uh, Amos Yadlin again. Uh, Amos, who's an old and dear friend, and I don't know who's mentoring whom. Uh, what I do know is that he knows a lot more than I do. Uh, so I listen to you, and I'm always glad to be here. Now, we are going to talk uh, in this session about uh, the rising and falling powers in the Middle East. So we're going to lift our gaze a little bit uh, from the uh, give and take and the here and now of what is going on in, next to the Golan or what is going on uh, next to Galilee or next to Gaza and look at uh, the relative roles of uh, the uh, former great powers, the current great powers, and the future great powers uh, in and around this region. And uh, to do this, we have a great panel, and I will, I will call on each one of them uh, to come up to the floor. Uh, first one, of course, is John Allen. Uh, where is John? Where is John? Where is John? Here you are. Uh, John Allen is currently president of the Brookings Institution. He is, uh, I think, very well known to all of you, and I'm not going to read out his resume. It would take us a much too long time. Uh, 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 no, 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 no. It, uh, it, would, it would lead to all sorts of discussions. Uh, uh, but uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, not only is John a remarkable military person, a remarkable Marine, the first Marine who commanded a theater of war. It's quite interesting. Uh, but, and this is of particular interest in the era of Trump, he is used to running multinational coalitions. ISAF in Afghanistan, how many countries were involved? 37, 38? 50. 50. Oh, got it wrong. And as for the the global coalition to counter ISIL 67? 67. Oh, got it right. Uh, uh, so this is a person a little bit like uh, Eisenhower during the Second World War, uh, who was paid in, to a large extent according to his ability to make all sorts of different people work together to achieve a common aim. And... Uh, that is a quality which apparently is maybe less held in esteem in Washington today than it has been before. But we'll get to that in due time. Uh, then I'll call on Helen Legal. Uh, she is also well known to all of our Israeli friends here. She's the French ambassador in Israel, has been for more than two years now. Welcome. And uh, she was also posted in Israel already during the 90s. So she's had a, more than a little experience uh, of this country and of this part of the world. She's also, and this is quite interesting, uh, she's an Africa specialist. She has spent a lot of her professional life uh, working uh, on African affairs with African countries. This is something which is obviously not of indifference uh, to Israel uh, or indeed to the great powers that we're going to uh, talk about in a couple of minutes. And last but not least, and I'll call on Vladimir Yakunin. Uh, Vladimir Yak uh, <coughs> Ivanovich Yakunin. Uh, uh, no, 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 the patronymic always sounds good. Uh, uh, has been interesting career, and it also helps make for a very interesting panel in terms of the balance of uh, background professions. Uh, 
a person who has served on the State Committee of the Council of Ministers of the USSR at the Abraham Yoffe Institute for Physics and Technology at the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, served as first secretary of the Soviet diplomatic mission to the UN uh, a few years after I served at the French mission uh, to, to the UN. We're about the same age. Uh, and uh, moving from the USSR to Russia, uh, he has been, amongst other things, the head of one of the world's largest infrastructure corporations, that is the uh, Russian railways. In, the, in a country as vast as Russia, railways are a unifying factor of the first order. Uh, uh, and this also brings something to the table, which is quite unusual. Uh, in 2014, you got a little bit into trouble uh, with our American friends uh, who put you on the sanctions list after the annexation of Crimea. Not by me. Uh, no, no, not by you. Not by you. <laughs> not by you, of course, by the Americans. Uh, and, uh, we didn't mean but this has not prevented you from uh, continuing to work in various endeavors, and notably as chairman of the supervisory board of the Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institute, which is headquartered in Berlin at the, in the Französische Straße, a few meters from where I worked in Berlin over the last few years. Uh, now, I'll take it in alphabetical order. And John, I'll ask you the first question. And I'll ask a similar, but for fairly obvious reasons, not identical question. Uh, to the two followers, and that is, it'll be a question about uh, the rise and the fall of the power where you come from. Uh, 2011 uh, was the year of, uh, what was it called, leading from behind in Libya. 2013 was the year of the red line in Syria. 2019 is apparently the year of withdrawing after, from Syria after a telephone call with President Erdogan. Has the United States definitely decided to play a second order role in the Middle East? Uh, uh, is this a choice? Because what I see is actually more continuity between Obama and Trump than I think either of the two presidents would want to see. Uh, how definitive is this? Well, first, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back in Israel. Uh, I'm an American by birth, but uh, Israel is very much the home of my heart, and so it's wonderful to be back. And Mr. Lowy, it's wonderful to see you again, and thank you for your magnificent support of this institute and my comrade-in-arms, uh, Amos Yadlin. And I had the chance last December uh, to be at the Lowy Institute in Sydney with Steve, where we talked about China and North Korea and Pretty quickly, what you understand are the, these two great uh, centers of intellectual development have got the world surrounded. And so we better pay close attention to what happens at these institutes. So thank you very much, sir, for the invitation. And almost it's wonderful to see you again. Uh, I think you're right in many respects uh, about the, the connection, the seeming trajectory uh, of the United States and the region. And, and I would, I would probably uh, describe President Obama's view uh, less about an abandonment of the region than a sense that the region needed to find an equilibrium that didn't require a constant, massive American military presence in the region. And you'll recall, all of us will recall, that he was elected to office. Uh, part of the principle of uh, platform uh, of his uh, election was ultimately to uh, get the United States out of two wars. Uh, in the region. He worked very hard to do that. And I was present in many respects when he made the decision ultimately to enter the region again uh, on the issue of the Islamic State. And it was a very difficult decision for him to make, uh, to re-enter that region. Um, but if you watch what happened, and you gave us a number of benchmarks, the uh, Libya campaign, the red line in Syria in 13, uh, our departure at the end of 11 from uh, Iraq, our departure measure in, uh, from Afghanistan at the end of uh, 14, 
um, you can see that there is, there has been a, a major shift in the view and the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the region. But I have to tell you that the region still remains extraordinarily important to us, uh, if for no other reason than uh, the commitment of the United States to Israel. Uh, and that will, I think, always be at the heart of uh, American policy in that regard. And while uh, I think we can say that uh, much of what uh, President Trump has done in Syria was, in fact, a, a continuation, uh, perhaps an invigoration of the Obama uh, commitment to Iraq and Syria in the wake of the Islamic State, uh, the difficulty that we see there now in Syria is one, I think, which uh, is going to create uh, some very serious policy challenges for the United States in the very near future. We have, for example, with the most recent tweet, uh, made the decision to withdraw most of our special operators from north, uh, northeast Syria, where by, I think by any measure there was great success in dealing with the Islamic State and stabilizing a population and uh, giving a large uh, segment of that population some hope. And we were in the process of building the, the uh, stabilization of that population when we woke up one morning after a late night phone call with President Erdogan and suddenly we're finding ourselves evacuating northeast Syria. Uh, that means that for all intents and purposes the skin that the United States had in the game in the Syria conflict uh, has largely been abandoned and that leaves, uh, not surprisingly, the preponderance of the outcome of that conflict is going to be in the hands of uh, Russia and uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, it also, I think, undermined the European uh, capacity to have a voice in this process as well, although many of us still desire that Europe have an important role in this process. So um, the combination of the transition from Obama to Trump uh, is not as different as you might imagine, but we've just given up a lot of our leverage, I think, in the region uh, with this recent decision, and we're going to see how it plays out. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, you mentioned Europe, and uh, I turn towards uh, Hélène Legal. Well, first of all, do you, do you agree with this basic assessment, that is, that uh, the reduction of the American profile is weakening Europe's ability to weigh on events? And more broadly, uh, does Europe actually still have a role? And if it has a role, what is the role? Because what I tend to see maybe wrongly, uh, is uh, uh, occasional initiatives, uh, sometimes brilliant, sometimes not so brilliant. The brilliant initiative is you know, Macron rescuing Hariri uh, from what would, could have been a bone saw moment in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, it's the agreement between uh, Angela Merkel and Erdogan about the stopping of the refugee flow from Syria uh, to Europe. Uh, it's the French participation alongside the UK and the US in the bombing operation in, in Syria when chemical weapons had been used uh, in Dura uh, near Damascus. Uh, but I don't see very much of a connecting thread, certainly not at the European level, and possibly not that much of a thread either at the French level. So what do you, what do you how do you react to that? Uh, thank you and, and thanks to the INSS for this conference and for its contribution to the strategic debates in Israel and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, on your question, I would say that, um, well, Europe itself uh, doesn't define itself as a military powers. And what we see in the Middle East is that uh, the military powers are predominant. Uh, external military powers and internal military powers, and even non-state military powers like uh, uh, ISIS or, uh, or, or other, other groups. But I think Europe can play a role, because if you look at the, at the economy of the different countries of the Middle East, neither US nor Russia are their main partners. The main partners are Asia, and especially China, or the European Union. So, uh, and, and there is, uh, so Europe, the European Union can be first a model. It's the only region in the world where there is no, in, uh, no organism for economic integration at all. Look at all the other continents, there is something. Here, nothing. 
so the European Union can be a model. Second, the European Union can play a role to give back some sovereignty to the countries. Uh, one of the key in the region is, is to help some, uh, some states to get back the sovereignty over non-state actors, or I'm thinking about Iraq, for example. I'm thinking about Lebanon, for example. Europe can play a key role in that. And of course, I'm thinking about Syria and the need for a comprehensive political solution to the conflict. Um, and third, I see another role for the EU is to give some international guarantees which are really needed in the region because, as I said, there is no regional forum, no regional integration, economic integration on even, or even dialogue. And, it can be, and that's why I think that the reason why the Europeans are so um, obsessed with international law and with non-proliferation regimes like NPT or OPCW, and there is a need to create new ones, I think. And that's what we try to do with initiatives like on other subjects like minorities in the Middle East, initiatives on the, plur uh, the, the pluralistic religions of the region. Another initiative was the Fund for Cultural Heritage with the Emirates. Uh, and a third initiative, the Conference in Paris on Financing Terrorism. And I think that 10 years ago, many of the countries of the region wouldn't have tried to adhere to the standards of this uh, uh, conference, and this time many of them are into it. So there is a role, certainly. But I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic in general, because the tools of the EU are soft tools, diplomacy, and I think diplomacy is in crisis, not only in the Middle East, but in general, first, because countries do not respect anymore their words and their signature. And second, because, because to make a compromise, to find a solution, you have to, be, to, to agree on facts. And facts now are ma manipulated, and we cannot even agree on facts. Thank you. And now, uh, Vladimir Ivanovich, Russia. Now, before 2013, before the red line moment, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, Russia's role was relatively low-key, and in a way, one could describe it, maybe unfairly, but one could describe it as essentially obstructive, that is, preventing the Western powers from uh, securing legitimization of their initiatives through the Security Council. Russia, China, and like-minded countries were spending their time essentially saying no, but having relatively little influence on the course of events. Then in 2013, the Americans decide not to respect their own red line, uh, Russia steps in diplomatically, uh, fills the vacuum, and in 2015, Russia also intervenes militarily, fills the broader military vacuum, and has been enjoying a quite substantial success in terms of achieving its own goals uh, in the region, and at the same time enhancing its own position as a, a prime, if not the prime, outside player in this region. How did this happen? That is, in terms of decision-making in Russia, was this a moment Russian leadership had been working towards, and when the moment appeared in 2013, you seized it? Or was this more... Uh, the ability to seize a chance when a chance presented itself, that in effect you received a gift from heaven and you ran with it. What is the, what is the balance of contingency and of planning? Okay, thank you very much. I will start um, to convey my great thanks to General Yedlin for inviting me to this institute and to this conference. And... Um, uh, you know, from the beginning, I would like to be absolutely clear that uh, through my life, I was conducting several lives. And it is open now, I can admit, that for 22.5 years, I was intelligence officer while I was doing many other jobs. So it should be clear, and I'm not covering everything, anything, you know, just admit me as I am. 
because I published a book, I admitted that, and then, you know, hearing my autobiography in very, you know, <laughs> special uh, edited form, it is a little bit uh, not uh, a little bit awkward for me. Then, you know, I suppose the substance of your question should be directed not to Vladimir Yakunin, but better to Vladimir Putin. <laughs> you know, I am you know something about the man? Yeah, I know something, but not from the process, not from the institution. That is my work as a researcher. And uh, here I present my own opinion and opinion on the part of Dialogue of Civilization, which we created as a platform, World Public Forum, more than 18 years ago. So we have some experience. But again, I'm not representing any agency, any government. I am, you know, here as a chairman of the board of Dialogue of Civilization and Russian citizens. Sorry, ju just let me step in a moment. Okay. I simply remind everybody that we are on Chatham House rules, uh, which uh, means that uh, anything which is said here cannot be attributed to the person who has spoken the corresponding words, whether on the panel or later on uh, from the floor in the discussion. Listen, so, you know, I'm terrified. Everybody's saying something, you know, to be secret, you know. No, 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 no <laughs> secret. Okay. Just okay. Uh, now, Con now conversation okay, us. very good. Thank you very much. And <laughs> now coming to this issue, the only present for the heaven, you know, we Russians are getting, were getting and getting, that is holy fire in Jerusalem on Russian Orthodox, or, you know, yes, Russian Orthodox Easter. Everything else that is hard work, hard labor, and, you know, the history of Russia. R Russian Federation, Russian Empire, etc. No heaven gifts so far. From this point of view, I suppose I can answer your question the following way. It was consequences of the events and the actual evaluation of the situation in this region combined with the internal aspects because, you know, we Russians, we consider the situation in this region, specifically in Syria, from two perspectives. You know that in Russia we have more than 14 million Muslims. It was always like that. More or less, it was always like that. And through the history of Russian empires, through the history of the Soviet Union, through the history of Russia, with some, you know, aspects, mm, we can say that those two fractions of the Russian society were living together. We have this experience. And then later we learn that more than 5,000 fighters of ISIS are of the Russian citizenship. Of course, it created a great concern, I suppose, internally. Externally, you know, you were absolutely correct. Russia withdraw, or Russia with state, outstate. But at some moment when those two aspects, internal and external, combined, I suppose that was a logical decision on the part of Russian leadership, you know, to at least not to intervene, to do something about that. And you remember, and you all know, that Russians were appealing appealing to the coalition, appealing in a way of collaboration to Americans, appealing, very appealing to, uh, you know, European, listen, we should do something together. But they were turned off. So, again, I am just not speculating, I am expressing my opinion, you should understand. I don't know what was the process of making the decision. But for me, it was obvious at that time, and it is more, even more obvious now, that that was evaluation of the consideration on the part of Russian leadership that Russia should prevent the negative impact of what we had as an ISIS here in Syria, not to influence the internal situation and to try to you know, to finish with ISIS where it was born. So from this perspective, I would like also to remind, listen, 
one can like uh, the you know president of Syria, one can hate him, but we all should obey the law. And from the point of the view of the law, it is sovereign country. Even when you know two thirds of the territory was seized by terrorists. And it was in the best, you know, ideas of all the community, you know, to fight terrorism. Americans declared that first, declared the war against the terrorism. So, you know, me personally, I don't understand and I don't accept the fact that we cannot create another type of coalition, another type of cooperation. I suppose that is the issue which should be possibly considered by this institute and of course not be now, settled at since, this conference. Since you're talking about the future, now getting to the second round of questioning okay. actually, this, uh, this is, uh, we are where we are, what are we going to do next? Now, and I'll take this in reverse order, and that is indeed, uh, Bashar is not going to be overthrown by the rebellion. Uh, that part of the, st of the movie or of the series, season one is over. Season two is beginning. Uh, what is season two of this particular game, if it's not a game, but of this situation going to look like now that you have saved Bashar, now that ISIL has been pretty well uh, uh, put under the lid, notably by the coalition of which John was such a powerful uh, element who managed to infuse trust amongst these 67 very different countries, something which I think no other country than the US could actually have done. Uh, what is going to happen next? What is Russia, what is Russia going to assign itself as its purpose because your purpose until now has been well well has been easy to describe at what is what is the next step what do you want to do again i can give only my no, own no, sure, perspective no, no. sure no. and first of all uh, may i say that was not russian intentions to preserve the regime it was not Bashar assad who was you know preserving by russians we were, and that is my you know, humble opinion, but I suppose I am true, we were saving our own interests outside Russia by fighting terrorism. It is not the case when we should measure who made more. Coalition or Russian troops does not matter, but at this moment we were fighting terrorism together without proper organization of coalition or something, and that was number one, and that was good. Secondly, you know, I suppose maybe you don't agree with me, specifically, specifically the chief of staff retiring now, that it was in the best interest of, of this country, Israel, to keep integrity of Syria because if it was, you know, fragmented with different types of terrorists, it was, it could have been nightmare much more than all the problems Israel was facing and facing now. This is second. And the third, I suppose that, you know, political ambitions should step aside and, you know, the entire world, Europe, United States of America, Russia, other external actors should find the platform how to deal further to eliminate, you know, finally terrorism. Of course, you know, it is not possible to eliminate terrorism like that, you know, one year or two years, but to eliminate terrorism in this era and to find the support of many Arab countries who are distinguished themselves from terrorist attacks. They don't want to be mixed with that, like Israel. And I suppose this is a platform for some kind of a new cooperation. But here, you know, political ambitions and internal interests can make some obstacles, if you know what I mean. Yeah, now let me turn to Hélène Legal. We have just heard what Vladimir Ivanovich has been saying. 
from the European perspective, and I'll play devil's advocate for a moment, a, isn't this a relatively comfortable situation? The, uh, the coalition against ISIL has essentially worked. The situation in Syria is not great, but it's comparatively clear with the Russians keeping some degree of control vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Bashar's other partners, notably Iran. Uh, and the modus vivendi between Russia and Israel, whereby uh, the Russians do not prevent or do not try to prevent the Israelis from conducting the campaign between wars, and the Israelis don't press the envelope so hard that the Russians would react. Isn't this a comfortable situation for us Europeans? Uh, do we still have a role in this particular space above and beyond uh, the generic type of relations that you described earlier on, which I assume are going to continue in the cultural, economic, social, soft power uh, arena? But is there a space for us strategically? No, the situation is not uh, com comfortable for us, I think, because there are still many problems in Syria. First, terrorism, okay, has been weakened, but uh, ISIS is still there, so there, there is still work uh, for the coalition or for those who want to stay involved in the fight against terrorism in Syria. Second, Iran. Iran is a threat for Israel, and the security of Israel is part of our priorities in the Middle East. And second, more generally, we have a problem with Iran. We don't have necessarily the same answers to, to this problem as the US or is Israel. I'm speaking about the nuclear issue, but the, there are three main problems, nuclear issue, ballistic issues, and the regional influence uh, of Iran all over the region, uh, including in Syria and Lebanon. And to let the situation as it is, is to give the victories to Iran. The regime of uh, Mr. Assad wouldn't stay without the support of Iran. And the third, re third reason why we are not happy and not comfortable is that there is a, a, um, a creation of a lost generation all over the region with these millions of refugees and IDPs from Syria, future terrorists, if uh, they are not able to come back, but to come back with guarantees. And now they cannot. Uh, so there is a, a, a need for a comprehensive political solution with a constitution, with election, with guarantees for the refugees to come back. And Europe, as the other players, can play a role in all that. Thank you. Now, John, I'm old enough to remember uh, that there are all sorts of terrorists in this region, and including the terrorists from Hezbollah, who killed uh, 299 French and American soldiers in Beirut in 1983, on the same day. Uh, this is a region which, of course, is not particularly Clausewitzian in terms of the way the rules of conflict tend to be played out, although that can be disputed. There are different ways of reading Clausewitz. But there's one way of reading Clausewitz which I think is, applies to this region as to others, and that is you have to determine what your center of gravity is going to be. We know what the center of gravity has been until now. And it has been very much the fight against Islamic State, so-called. Uh, but what next? Uh, we have the continuing problem with Iran and its companion problem, the nexus of Hezbollah al-Quds in Syria. Uh, we have Saudi Arabia apparently now engaging in the production of solid fuel ballistic missiles, uh, which is something which I wouldn't necessarily disapprove of if there were a strong record of Saudi competence in terms of doing stuff which is as intrinsically dangerous as producing solid fuel. 
uh, uh, competence and Saudi are two words which do not live in the same house. Uh, so uh, if I were Israeli, or indeed if I were within range of Saudi rockets, I would probably be just as scared as I would be of Iranian rockets, not for the same reason. Uh, uh, where would you now apply the Schwerpunkt, once you, one has taken into account the fact, of course, ISIS has not been entirely, absolutely, totally crushed, but there, there is a little bit of a difference between the situation of ISIS today and the situation of ISIS after the fall of Mosul. Uh, so you, as a general, a former general, retired, but looking at things with the military's eye, where would your Schwerpunkt be? How would you, or, how would you organize uh, your force array vis-à-vis uh, -vis this region? Um, well, it's a very important question. Let me take a moment, though, and comment on uh, our Russian colleagues' views on how the war in Syria unfolded. Um, the United States entered the war against the Islamic State, initially in Iraq, and eventually uh, with the coalition into Syria. Uh, we never uh, agreed on the definition of terrorism as it was uh, uh, explained by Bashar al-Assad and supported by his Russian allies. Uh, and in many respects, the United States and the coalition bared down or bore down directly upon the Islamic State. Uh, the Russian assistance to the coalition in dealing with the Islamic State was always minimal. Uh, in fact, the Russian firepower with Bashar al-Assad was concentrated primarily on much of the Syrian population that we would have called the moderate Syrian population that were not in fact terrorists, but in fact were potential participants in a political process that could have uh, taken us somewhere uh, beyond where we are today. Um, and in the end, while the coalition was primarily and almost thoroughly occupied with dealing with the Islamic State, uh, the outcome of the Russian intervention in Syria has, in fact, uh, created a greater entrenchment for Iran, has strengthened Hezbollah, and has left in place a genocidal regime. And, sir, you talk about law. He's not been held accountable for the murder of 100,000 or more of his own people. And so when we start to apply the law and accountability to that regime and to those who assisted him in that regime and its outcomes, much accountability remains to be determined. So let me get to my point, though. Um, we have to oppose Iran in this region. We have to oppose Iran for a variety of reasons. It's the greatest destabilizing influence in the region. It is the principal patron of Hezbollah, which is a strategic threat to Israel. And because of our relationship with Israel, we must uh, support uh, the, the opposition to Hezbollah. Uh, and we must, uh, as well, support the Sunni Arab elements, which are suffering from enormous capacity to govern themselves with detached economic capabilities, which the outcome of which across the entire region creates just a, a perpetual uh, uh, radicalization of the population with no hope of the changing of the circumstances under which they live. And that radicalized population is pushed into the arms of one jihadist movement after another, and we can find ourselves in perpetual conflict. So if I were the general to offer suggestions to a president that would, in fact, listen to them, <laughs> I would say several things. One is, let's work with Russia to find a way to stop the violence in Syria, number one. Number two, do what we need to to support our our ally in the region, Israel, uh, to prevent uh, Iranian infraction, to prevent ir Iranian um, uh, escalation of the conflict, and to help Israel in every possible way we can to uh, prevent uh, forward movement of uh, Hezbollah. We have to support the Sunni regimes in the region as best we can because they suffer from an enormous absence of capacity, both to govern and obviously in the military capacity as well. That doesn't mean we need large numbers of American troops stationed in the region. We have done quite well with our special operators backed up by American long-range firepower uh, and coalition firepower to accomplish things uh, on the ground. And that combination between the quiet support to Israel in the manner in which it operates within the region, our strengthening our Sunni partners so that we can create greater governance 
uh, incorporate greater economic opportunity for the people to reduce the amount of radicalization that generates Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda 2.0, the Islamic State, Al-Islamic State 2.0. We have got to get upstream from the battles. I'm frankly tired of fighting in the Middle East against jihadist elements that are grown full bore out of the ground when we could have taken steps farther upstream to reduce the radicalization of populations and reduce the recruits into these terrorist organizations. So I think that we have a two-fold process. We have to strengthen elements within the regimes uh, around the Sunni elements, the Sunni countries, but we also have to have a comprehensive plan for pushing back against Iran across the entire region. Now, I, I've heard all of you, uh, and John in particular, uh, you mentioned the success of Special Operations Forces. Uh, uh, the French, the Brits, others have been part of that as well. And in a way, haven't we been too successful? This may be a somewhat surprising question, but when I look at the map of, of what used to be Syria, there, there is a state called Syria, but, uh, uh, or a place called Syria, but there is no state called Syria anymore. Uh, one quarter of the place is now in, uh, I, I use shorthand, PKK hands. A, uh, air, vast swathes of Syrian territory which were never populated by the Kurds are now being, are actually under Kurdish military control alongside uh, uh, Arab elements who receive our support. Now in saying this, I'm perfectly conscious that this is not simply an American thing, it's also a French thing, we've been very much part of that. Uh, but how do we deal with that? And in a way, although I entirely disapprove of the manner in which President Trump took the decision to withdraw American troops the way he has been doing, uh, wasn't, he ba wa wasn't he basically right in a perverse sort of way? Uh, wasn't it time to begin to ratchet back the support for the PKK, that the problem, the Kurdish problem was becoming more important in some ways than the Daesh 1.0 problem and risked by ricochet to sure. generate the ISIL 2.0 problem? In a word, no. Uh, he was wrong. <laughs> the, de the decision, was, the decision. was utterly wrong. Uh, we were not done. Much of, the, much of Daesh, much of the organization had been badly degraded. But the stabilization of the population is how you keep these organizations from reflashing. And we're still fighting there every day. Just recently I got uh, information from one of my special operator commanders that I'd worked with who told me that they had in fact been in a huge battle along the Euphrates. We were stabilizing that population. And if there was going to be a rump state in Syria for a couple of years, so be it. <coughs> Again, there is a political process underway right now, whether it's Astana or whether it's taken over by the UN. Let the political process unfold. But let's, let's not pull the American and the Western and the coalition support for 60,000 people that we trained and hundreds of thousands that are living in conditions far better than almost anywhere else in Syria. Let's stabilize that population. Let's hold control of that ground until the political process moves forward in a manner where that portion of Syria can be reassimilated back into a larger Syria whatever that might look like, which I can't frankly envisage right now. But the, the reconstruction of Syria is going to be somewhere between 400 and 600 billion dollars. And, bef and before Sorry. we give a penny of that to the, to the regime in Damascus, we, we've got to get some guarantees of what's going to happen to these populations and they're not going to be massacred under foreign firepower or by the work of the Iranians or Hezbollah because we set them up to be uh, massacred in the end because we withdrew too early. I, I'm, I'm glad you raised the money issue. A, not, and I'm not going to get into a round of Syrian stuff, which is actually going to get us away from our topic in a way. Uh, but uh, who actually has money these days? Uh, certainly not Russia. Uh, the European Union, not if we want to stay anywhere near uh, the strictures of the European Commission. And the United States does not seem to be in a giving mood either. Uh, there's only one place which actually has money, it's called China. Uh, how do you, the three of you, and very briefly, because this is the final round, see in a, let's say, a 20-year perspective, the role of China in this region? After all, China 
has an economy which is nearly the size of the US. It has a defense budget which is twice, to, twice the size, at least, of the Russian defense budget. And its population is greater than the combined populations of the three entities represented on this panel. So why don't you, why don't you go first, Vladimir? Okay. <clears throat> As you see, uh, Chinese now are not very active in this area, of course. And you know, judging by the economic situation globally and in China, I don't think that they are so eager you know, to, to bring money to where and to whom. This is first point. And, uh, but of course, China cannot withdraw because they are pretending now to be global power. And you know, in all my interventions with the Chinese authorities and scientists and businessmen, you know, I do feel that, you know, you know this economic growth demand that they should obtain a proper political, geopolitical, you know, uh, position in the world. So it is inevitable that China should be considered. To my mind, it is, um, for, for, the now, for now, we have only two instruments. This is Geneva and Astana process in terms of collaboration and cooperation, bringing the peace to Syria. And you know, I don't want that, you know, Alan, you consider that it is usual, you know, game. Russian and American are, sit are sitting, one mentions something, the other is answering, and then we are not, we are losing the perspective. But I should point out, as a sanctioned person, I know that every money I'm spending are known everywhere. European bank, you know, in America, and everywhere. How could it be that until Soviet fighters, oh, I'm sorry, Russian fighting fighters, you know, destroyed the convoy of oil, the entire world suddenly, after three years, you know, appeared to understand that illegal trading of oil bringing hundreds of millions of dollars were not noticed. And I suppose, again, that is proof that we should unite. And you know, you know, from my point of view, I am not the one okay. to judge. You know whether American no president is correct or not. But I suppose it is for Europe, for the United States of America, for Russia, and all actors, Israel included, to create the process of reunification. Point, point understood. Moving to China after a, a short uh, reminder that Colin Powell, at the beginning of the Iraqi crisis in 2002. Uh, when he was uh, 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 trying to uh, rein in George W. Bush, Colin Powell said, you break it, you keep it. You broke, you own it, yeah. Pottery barn rules. You break it, you own it. The ruins of Syria, Russia now owns. Over to you. Now, on China, uh, of course, China is... Uh, <laughs> Is a, is a global power, but I think China likes to act um, where countries are stable and is more, much more involved in trade than in reconstruction or development aid. So uh, I don't see China in Syria, for example, for the moment. Where is the money? The money is ex exactly where it is in other ca similar cases, in the World Bank, in the IMF, in the European Commission, in the USAID. The money is there, but the conditions are not there in Syria for a huge involvement, and there is a tendency now for a rapid normalization, as we see with our Arab partners, for example, before the political co co condition uh, be, being achieved. So there will be money, but the, the, the time is not yet for bringing all this money to, to Syria. Thank you. John, over to you. China. Uh, and I agree with Vladimir on uh, we have got to come together. I mean, this, this, this is too big for us all to be a part on this issue. And Astana may well, in fact, be the breakthrough. Uh, it, it, we just can't have to come together. And I agree with the ambassador about uh, China. China typically invests in a, in a sure thing. Uh, reconstruction is never a sure thing. Uh, if you look around the world today where the Chinese are investing, there has been the uh, derivation or the creation of a term, debt trap diplomacy. 
uh, where the Chinese have very explicit economic and political objectives that typically follow uh, their, their uh, economic investments into almost anything. Um, the one thing I'll say, and the ambassador is exactly right, it's a list of uh, regional banks, development banks, the IMF, the World Bank, those states that are economically well off, that are willing to contribute. There will be funds. We don't have to try to fix this all at once, but the one thing I will say, and I hope this is where we end up as a global coalition for the reconstruction of Syria, and that is not one penny flows to Damascus without an absolute guarantee on its behavior as a direct result of that money. And that behavior is about the presence of Iran. That behavior is about the presence of Hezbollah. That, pres that behavior is going to be about how they will treat the populations that will be stabilized. And unless we get those kinds of guarantees from the central government in Damascus backed up by a contact group perhaps of the leading states involved here, the money should not flow. And if it does flow, then we should see very explicit stabilization and reconstruction outcomes that ultimately benefit the Syrian people who have suffered so badly from this war. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, all three of you. Thank you for having, uh, John in particular, ended this on a note, maybe not of hope, but at least of some sort of guidance as to what uh, hopefully may come next, but personally I'm not holding my breath. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for your patience. I, uh, I want you to share this great panel. Thank you. We committed one mistake. We did not congratulate the audience with a great winning in Grand Prix in Judo. <laughs> Let it be the best victory of yours. Thank you very much. Thank you all.